Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Bill Roach and this is another episode of Timeless Dialogues where we discuss issues in theology, philosophy, apologetics, and politics. And what we're going to do today is we're going to answer the question, who is the prophet in Deuteronomy 18? Now, many people out there might wonder, why are we discussing this topic? Why now? What difference does it make? Well, the reason it's important is because this is one of the fundamental issues that separates Christianity from Islam, whether or not Jesus Christ or Muhammad is the true prophet of God. Now, this is also important because it comes down to whether or not we're going to follow Christianity or Islam. And the claims of Islam is that Muhammad is the fulfillment of this prophet, that Jesus Christ was one of many, but the true ultimate final prophet is Muhammad. Now, Christians would say Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that prophet and that Jesus Christ is the true representative of God from God to the people and from the people to God. So the reason this is important, because it really comes down to which religion is actually true or whose prophet of which religion is actually true. Now, one quick caveat about this. Christianity recognizes that Jesus Christ is the true prophet, priest and king. They're claiming that Jesus Christ is not just a prophet, he's more than a prophet, namely, he's the eternal son of God. So if Jesus Christ is wrong about this, then Jesus Christ would also be wrong about his claims to divinity. Because as God, Jesus Christ cannot make a false truth claim. But as a prophet of God, if Jesus Christ made false prophecies, then he would be a false prophet. Conversely, if Muhammad is not this true prophet, then the Quran is wrong and it necessarily disproves Islam as a true religion. So let's dive into this topic here today. Who is the prophet of Deuteronomy 18? And as we look at this passage, I want us to just kind of think about a few of the claims by Muslims. Muslims claim that Muhammad is the real object of God's covenant and in him and him alone are the prophecies fulfilled from the Old Testament. Specifically, we're going to read this passage specifically about who is the great prophet to come. In addition to this, it is impossible to obtain the truth or any true religion from the Gospels. This is what they're going to claim, unless you read and interpret them from an Islamic and strict Unitarian point of view. Now, there are two issues that are going on here. First of all, there is the teaching within Islam that the New Testament is a corrupt document. And because it's a corrupt document, you can't trust anything that it's actually claiming. Second of all, it's claiming this, that you must interpret it from an Islamic and strict Unitarian point of view. So in order to understand what's actually being taught about who this prophet is, or maybe any of the claims that are in the Gospels, you must interpret them from the lens of the Quran and Islamic point of view, but you must necessarily do it from an anti-Trinitarian point of view. You can't affirm that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that God is one in essence, three in persons. Now, related to that, the reason that this is important is because they're trying to say it's impossible to obtain the truth or truth of any religion from the Gospels. So you're going to have to get it exclusively from Islam and Muhammad, the true prophet, not from Jesus Christ as the true and final prophet, specifically as understood in the Gospels. Another caveat, they recognize that Jesus is a prophet, but he was greater succeeded by Muhammad. Now, as we continue looking at this, the whole point of it is, is that in short, Muhammad and not Jesus Christ is the foretold prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Now, here's what the passage reads. It says this, a new prophet like Mo Moses, Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18. And just listen to what it says here. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. And now what we're finding here is that in this context here, this is being spoken with Moses and it's an interaction that's coming about in the book of Deuteronomy. And we see this is that it's Moses is giving this in the text of scripture saying, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you, 
from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he will speak to them all that I command. So the big point is this, is that we're looking for who's the Moses-like prophet that's going to be given to the people of God. And when you look at verse 18, it talks about how this prophet's going to be raised up like Moses among their brothers. But here's the key word. I'm going to put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. So the question is, who is the prophet? Is it Jesus? Is he the individual who is raised up like Moses and has the words of God put in his mouth and he's going to speak to them all that God has commanded? Or is that figure Muhammad? Now, what I want us to look at here is that there's several key factors here is that God's going to raise up a prophet like Moses among the people from your brothers, and that he's going to be the mouthpiece of God, speaking the word of God to the people of God. Now, here's the response that I want to give to this, because I want to make this a short video, but I want to deal with several specific points, because I think it's important to be very clear on what we're saying and get straight to the point. So first of all, the text cannot refer to Muhammad because the term brothers means fellow Israelites. Notice in verse 18.1 what it's talking about in the earlier context. The Levitical priests and all the tribe of Levi shall have no portion with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance. But in the context, the audience was the Jewish Levites. In 18.2, it says this. They shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as he promised. So the term brothers here refers to Israel, not to Arab antagonists. The point is, is that in the immediate context, as we're seeing in this previous passage here, when it says the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers, the among you and the your brothers is the nation of Israel. It's not an Arab nation. In addition, what we have to see here is, is that the term brothers, like we said, refers to Israel, not to Arab antagonists. Remember, there's a strict antagonistic relationship between the people of God, namely the Jews, and in this sense, the Arabs. The point is, is that God would never raise up a prophet for Israel from their enemies. Why would God raise up a prophet for the people of God from the enemies of God? The classic way that we find in the text of scripture in which God brings his prophets to the nation of Israel, namely his true people, is from the nation of Israel. In addition here, the term brothers or brethren in other passages means fellow Israelites. God told the Jews to choose a king from among your brethren, not a foreigner. Israel never chose a non-Jewish king. So if we're going to look at that term and we're going to understand how it's used not only in the book of Deuteronomy, namely Deuteronomy 18.1 and 2, but also other passages within Deuteronomy closely associated to it, we find the term brothers or brethren, however we want to translate it into English, specifically means the Israelites. So we have good contextual reasons in the immediate context and in the broader passages that God is going to choose this individual, this prophet, this one from the brothers, from the people of God, not an antagonistic Arab nation. In addition, when we look at how this is fulfilled, the, the rising up of a king, Israel never chose a non-Jewish king. They always chose a Jewish king. So if we're going to see the prophet rose from the brethren in a similar sense, parable in, in this sense, in an analogical sense, we're going to see that just as the king came from the people of Israel, so too will the prophet come from the people of Israel. Another response, Muslims admit that Muhammad came from Ishmael. The Bible is clear that the heirs to the Jewish throne came from Isaac, not Ishmael. In addition to this, the Torah states, Oh, the Ishmael lived before you. God answered emphatically, My covenant I will establish with Isaac. So what we're finding is, is that when the Bible's talking about this Jewish throne and also the, the means by which God's covenant is going to come and the, the lineage of who is the people of God, it's through Isaac, not Ishmael. Isaac is the chosen son, 
not Ishmael. So the people of God comes from the descendants of Isaac, not from Ishmael. In addition to this, God in the Torah later says, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. The point is, is that, again, who is the lineage? Who's the seed? It comes from Isaac. Now, the New Testament, which is a historically reliable document, states that Jesus, not Muhammad, fulfilled Deuteronomy 18. Now, I would love to go into a long excursus about the historical reliability of the New Testament. I'm going to assume it for this conversation, and if you want further evidence for it, there are several other Christian apologetic works pertaining to that topic, but we will do a whole other episode on the historical reliability of the New Testament at a later time. But the point is, is that Muslims may claim that the New Testament's not historically reliable, but the fact of the matter is, is that the New Testament is the most historically reliable book from the ancient world. And because of that, it's a trustworthy book. Not only is it a historically reliable book, it's a divinely inspired book that brings with it the full authority of God to the people of God. So that book given to us from the prophets and the apostles of the New Testament, we find that it's talking about how Jesus is this true Moses-like prophet, not Muhammad. So as we look at this, we see a few other things. Jesus was born of his brethren. Jesus wasn't born to non-Jews or non-Israelites. Galatians 4 verses 4 through 5 states, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. So we find a few things here. It's this idea and the strong, sovereign, ordaining providence of God. God sent forth his son. It says, born of a woman. And this is talking about the virgin birth of Jesus Christ through Mary. But notice these two things. How did it come? Who was this woman? Who was, it was Mary, but this individual to come was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Well, which law is it referring to? The law of Moses. Who would be under the law of Moses? The Jews, the Israelites. Why? So that we might receive adoption as sons. Deuteronomy 18.18 18 says this, He shall speak to them all that I, God, command him. Now notice this. This prophet to come is going to speak forth all the words of God that God is going to command him. And when we look at Jesus Christ, he fulfills this. Jesus fulfilled this when he said, I do nothing of myself, but as my father taught me. Now notice this. I speak these things. So not only is Jesus born of a woman to the people of God under the law of God, but he's also fulfilling the specifics of the passage in Deuteronomy 18. Namely, he's speaking that which God has commanded him. In addition, Jesus also said, I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. Jesus is very clear in the Gospel of John that he didn't come of his one, his own authority, that what he spoke was not something of his own authority. Rather, it came from the Father, and it was specifically what the Father commanded him. And that's why he says, what I should say and what I should speak. As we continue here, what we find is, is that Jesus called himself a prophet, stating, Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. And so where did Jesus die? He died in Jerusalem because that's where the prophet was supposed to die, Luke 13, 33. But Jesus not only was giving this idea of the location of his death, which was fulfilled in his actual death, not only that he died, but the place that he died, but he's also claiming that he was a prophet. Jesus was claiming this in his ministry. In addition to this, as the Son of God, Jesus was a prophet, speaking to men for God, but he was also a priest, Hebrews 7 through 10, speaking to God for men, and as king, he was reigning over men for God. Jesus Christ was not only just the prophet, but he was the great priest and king. 
Now, Jesus fulfilled other characteristics of the prophet. Namely, only Jesus and not Muhammad was known to speak face to face with God. And we find that this is something that was given to Jesus because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And what we find here is, is that this idea that John is getting us is that Jesus was not only with God, but he was speaking to him face to face, much like Moses. And he performed signs and wonders. Notice this. The Quran even states that Muhammad did not perform miracles. Now, this great prophet was not only one who spoke the word of God to the people of God, but he confirmed this through miracles. So not only does Muhammad not fulfill the right people whom the prophet should come, not only does Muhammad not fulfill the fact that he didn't speak to God face to face, but he also didn't perform signs and wonders to confirm that he was a prophet from God. And this isn't something that Christians state. Even the Quran states that Muhammad did not perform miracles. Now, here's another thing that we have to see. The Jewish people considered Jesus a prophet. So not only did he come to the Jews, but the Jews even recognized him as a prophet. Now, obviously, this wasn't all the Jews, for it was through the Jews, namely, they were the ones who were very instrumental in seeing Jesus Christ put to death, namely at the hands of the Romans. But notice when Peter was preaching, he said that the Jews were guilty of the death of Christ. But the point is, is that the Jewish people recognized and considered Jesus a prophet. Consider these passages here. And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee, Matthew 21, 11. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, a great prophet has arisen among us, and God has visited his people, Luke 7, 16. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, Luke 24, 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet, John 4, 19. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world, John 6, 14. And when they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet, namely referring back to the text of Deuteronomy 18. And this comes from John 7, 14. But what we have to find is, is that in addition to this, so they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? Since he has opened your eyes, he said, he is a prophet. So what I want to say here in conclusion is, is that Jesus and Jesus alone fulfills the criterion of being the prophet of Deuteronomy 18. Why? Because he was born of the people of God, namely to the people of God. He was a Jew. Not only that, he was born under the law, which is a Jewish law. So in this sense, he's the one that's arising up from the brethren. In addition to it, the life of Jesus Christ fulfilled the true marks of a prophet because he spoke the word of God to the people of God. His life was confirmed as a prophet through signs and wonders and miracles. And even the people of God recognized that he was a prophet of God and they declared that he was a prophet of God. So, here's the crux of the matter. Who is the true prophet of God in Deuteronomy 18? From this short survey, we have to say that it was Jesus Christ and not Muhammad. So, the real conclusion is this, is that if we're going to be a people of the book, and we're going to follow who the prophet is from the Bible, we must be followers of Jesus Christ. We must become Christians. And the way that a person becomes a Christian is that they must recognize that we are all lawbreakers, that we have broken the law of God, and because we have broken the law of God, we come into the due punishment of breaking God's law. We're truly lawbreakers. We're guilty. We're due punishment. But this is specifically why Jesus Christ came. Jesus Christ came under the law and lived to fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. His active obedience fulfilled what the law demanded and required. He lived a perfect, sinless life. And here's one of the key things. We realize that for the wages of sin is death, and cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. 
Well, who was the one that was cursed and who was the one that died for us? Jesus Christ died upon the cross for our sins. And whoever turns in faith and repentance in Jesus Christ can be saved. For Jesus Christ was died upon the cross for our sins, but yet he resurrected bodily for our justification. And whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever turns to the true prophet, the true priest, the true king, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can find salvation. 